the idea behind quantum computing is that we have, like in the traditional computing, uh, uh, some entity that can be plus, minus, or zero, or, or one. And do I correct... Do I understand correctly that quantum physicists are still looking for the qubit, for some some entity that can play that role, one and zero, plus, minus? Yes, in a sense. Actually, quantum physicists have many different qubits and they have different advantages and disadvantages. We just don't know yet which one today uh, will make the race and to be the qubit that will be scalable, of which we can build a hundred million copies or a billion copies to actually build a functioning quantum computer. Do you but think there's there many different types of qubits. many different types? Do you think there will be one type that makes the race, as you say, or could it be that for different applications there will be different kinds of qubits? For computing, probably, my guess is there will be only one. Okay. Because it will take so much effort to finally then push that one so far that it's not probably efficient to also push other ones. But there could be other applications like for communication or for other quantum you know, things that can be inter of interest to be done. And there could be different systems that win there. Mm -hmm. So in the past, you know, before we had the transistor, we were also exploring many, many years ago different ways to switch currents on and off, which is what the transistor does. And back then, for example, we had the vacuum tubes, and they don't exist anymore today. Well, very few only exist. All of today's computers are made from semiconductor or silicon transistors. And that's how much this technology has taken over and won the race. And I believe it will be probably similar for, for quantum computing. But today, we don't know yet which one this will be and which one will be the vacuum tube you know, in the future. And the vacuum tube, being a guitarist, I know that there are some guitarists that want to play on amplifiers with a vacuum tube. So the old-fashioned vacuum tube still has its, uh, its functionality in some very specific applications. And many years ago, I played with a Cosmos um, set and one transistor was about uh, half a centimeter big and there were three wires coming out. One wire was the currency coming in. This was the source. One, the, uh, the, the, the electrons went out. This was the drain. And there was a third that uh, regulated like a water tap the flow of, of, of the electricity. Is this still the functionality, the principle of function, function of, of a transistor? Absolutely. It's a switch, as you described it, and one can turn the flow of electricity on or off. It's also an amplifier, but, but that's just drawing different shades on, on the same picture. And uh, the industry has, over the past maybe 50 years, taken an incredible journey and made a huge amount of progress in scaling transistors to ever smaller sizes. So, so I mentioned it was half a centimeter big in, in, in these former days. How big is a transistor today? Today's smallest transistors, which are some of those that we actually produce in our clean rooms, are only tens of nanometers, maybe 20 nanometers in size. Of course, you still need to connect from the outside the wires. They're still, you know, macroscopic wires. But the actual functional unit is maybe 50 or 20 nanometers in size. It's very, very small. And you, as I understood in your, in your presentation, want to go even smaller. Well, um, maybe not necessarily smaller at this point, because it's actually already incredibly difficult to produce these types of transistors that we do mm -hmm. because they're so small. We're already at the limit of what we can currently do with our present technology. So of course we can try to push the technology more and more and we are also doing that. But I think right now our efforts are more focused on trying to understand the physics of these uh, charges and the spins that are inside of these transistors to uh, try to understand them better and to try them actually to get to work as quantum transistors in a sense or as quantum bits. And in your presentation you were talking about holes. Uh, explain me what is a hole? I, and of course I know what a hole is, but do you use the same 
idea of holes, if you talk about holes, and where are the holes, what is in the hole and what for are the holes? A hole is an interesting concept from condensed matter physics. Imagine you have many, many, many electrons and they kind of f fill up to make like a lake, like a sea that's made out of water, but it's now just of electrons. And then when you go there and you take one electron out, it leaves behind a hole. And the properties of this hole, amazingly, can be substantially different from the properties of the electron. Not only does it have a different mass, and a different spin, it also has... Uh, I mean, a hole has no mass, a hole is empty, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but all the other holes around it form a state which then actually has these properties as a collective state. So, so yes, it's a kind of a more advanced uh, concept. It's maybe a little bit more difficult to imagine than an electron, but uh, what our research is now showing is that it can actually have many advantages for, uh, for actually using these uh, objects to, to build quantum bits. And tell me, how can you remove one single electron from a lake, as you call it, yes. of electrons. So it goes like this. So in semiconductors are materials which have a band gap. So that's a range of energies where we cannot have any states whatsoever. And this is surrounded by a bottom band, it's so-called valence band, which is completely filled. There, every state that's available on every atom, uh, there's an electron which is sitting. And then we have a conduction band at the higher energy, above the band gap, where there are no electrons whatsoever. It's exactly the opposite. It's completely empty in the conduction band, completely filled in the valence band. And now we go and we take one hole out. But you, you show me your fingers taking an electron. Yeah. How do you, I mean, your finger are too big to we, take an, an electron out of this. Absolutely. Yeah. We go into the clean room and we make a device which is so small that the size of the hole that we make is similar to the size of the nanostructure which we have fabricated. And then we actually take this out, not with my finger, but I go in the experiment and I apply a small, uh, actually a negative voltage to actually put the hole inside. We, in this way we pull out the electron. And, and that's, that can be done, and it can only be done if the structure is small enough. If it's too big, then we will immediately put three or ten or more of these holes uh, inside the structure. And these holes serve to do what? Well, the hole is the fundamental carrier of the quantum information. It turns out the way we do it, the hole will have a spin. A spin is uh, a property like mass or the charge. You know, the charge is the basis of all of uh, electronics and electromagnetism. The spin is a magnetic property. And you can actually think of it like the needle of a compass, like an arrow and it can point actually in an arbitrary direction in three-dimensional space. And you could say, if this arrow is pointing up, this corresponds to the state one, and if the arrow is pointing down, then it corresponds to the state zero. But here comes the beauty of quantum mechanics. An arrow can not only point down or up, it can actually point towards you, or it can point to the left, or in an arbitrary direction in space, and this arbitrary direction is the situation when mathematically the qubit is simultaneously pointing with some probability up and with some probability down. So the arrow is a very nice uh, visualization mm -hmm. of this principle of superposition that we take advantage of in, in, in quantum computing and which comes from quantum mechanics. So this is not a thing we can touch, measure, see, it's more an idea, do I understand correctly? Uh, yes and no, you, you cannot touch it with your finger, it's just, you, know, you would yes, damage it immediately. Right. But, but uh, we can probe it with our experiments, with our electrical signals. We can detect its presence or absence, for example, in the structure. Or with our types of experiments, we can see whether this thing is pointing up or down. Or we can also drive it. I can, for example, do a 90 degree rotation and make it point towards you. And that's one of the fundamental gate operations. You know, a gate is an action, like a step in an algorithm. And one of these gates is a 90 degree rotation. And, and that's one of the things we're developing now, how to do this. And the, the, the magic here is that we can do this with electrical fields, even though the spin is a magnetic property. 
And that's where relativistic physics helps us to do that, because it makes this connection between magnetic and electrical properties. Talking about hopes for the future. In the announcement of, of that the symposium, there was there could be read um, um, precision medicine uh, needs computers that uh, calculate very fast, or 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 um, and the finance industry needs computers to calculate the development of the of the shares or whatever. Any problem that needs immense computer power is said to be a candidate for, for um, uh, quantum computing. Is this the principle of hope? Or is this realistic that someday we have a quantum computer that helps solve such problems? It's a bit of a mixture of hype and hope and facts. So there are some algorithms which are well known today, um, which are a lot faster with quantum computers than they would be on any classical system that we know today. And then there are some other algorithms which we're still looking for and which we're investigating where this is not so clear yet. So, um, for example, for me as a physicist actually, what quantum computers I think will be best at is simulating other quantum physical systems like molecules. Now molecules play an important role in many, many areas that affect uh, a lot of humanity. For example, in molecules for medicine, you can simulate, uh, so we hope in the future, uh, some molecules much better and much more efficiently with a quantum computer than you could with a classical computer. That's one example. Or you could find chemical reactions that could then work with much less energy. So you, you could save on the energy consumption on that. Or you could try to find new materials that could convert, I don't know, sunlight to electricity. Or you could find new ways of storing energy, new materials. There's many uh, avenues for, for putting a quantum computer to use. Some of them are still hypothetic today, but uh, uh, for other uh, cases, we know very well that quantum computing, and this has also already been demonstrated also, is exponentially faster. And when will the quantum computer be reality? I think it will be a number of years, not you know this year or next year, but, but maybe 10 years, I don't know. But uh, I, I think, if you look at the development of today's computers, it was also not, you know, we, we didn't go from, from not having any computer to having the super fast computers of today. There were many years in between and every year the computers got a little bit faster and had a little bit more memory. And I think maybe it will be similar with quantum computers. They will have, you know, 100,000 qubits, a million qubits. It will go up with some maybe similar to Moore's law, maybe a quantum Moore's law of some sort. And I think it will take some time to develop all of this. Uh, it took maybe 50 years to develop today's computers to the point where we are today. The hope is that it will be a lot faster, but to be honest, it takes already a long time. I started my PhD in 1998, and already I was working on this topic, and you know which year we have today, so it's already been a, quite a long time, but uh, uh, I'm quite optimistic, and, and I actually I think there is no other alternative to quantum computing. Otherwise, computing is sort of coming to its natural limit when the transistors become so small that they consist only of an atom or, or two. So just a few atoms, then they cannot make them smaller or faster. So I hear you are optimistic. The quantum computer will come. Uh, I wish you all the best for the journey, whether it takes five years, perhaps it takes more. Anyway, all the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>